As we go into your word, I pray that from your word we'll understand why you created sex and what are some ways in which we displease you when it comes to sex according to your word, not according to what some website is saying, not according to what our friends are saying, not even according to what our parents are saying, but from, but from your word. Oh Lord, today, speak to us in Jesus Christ, my prayer. Amen. Uh, you know, I heard about a dad and mom who wanted to have uh, what is called as a quickie, a quick sex, okay, one afternoon, but they didn't want their young son to know about it. Okay, he was around 11 or 12. So they sent him to the balcony. Let's call him Johnny. So Johnny's parents sent him to the uh, balcony of the house and dad and mom got busy with their quickie. But then mom told him, Johnny, tell me what you see in the flat. It's a beautiful flat with a lovely quadrangle in the middle. So keep talking to mommy. And then daddy and mommy got into the business of having a quickie, a quickie sex. And then uh, Johnny was speaking from the balcony. He said, Mommy, I see a truck coming with a pretty little, pretty little water bottles into our, into our flat colony. And then uh, Daddy and Mommy are busy right now. Uh, they, they're doing the next, uh, they are having sex. And then uh, Johnny said, The Iron Man is pushing his trolley and coming uh, into our colony. And then Daddy and Mommy get even more busy. And then on one corner, some, some guys are playing cricket. And then Daddy and Mommy almost are about to finish. But then, Even Tony's parents are having sex because he's also standing in the balcony. Tommy's also standing in the balcony, so even his parents are having sex. So talking about sex to young people is like giving a fish a bath. It's a dangerous job, it's a tricky job. But that's one of my life's callings. And that's because I probably uh, grew up in a home where we didn't even have normal conversations because my dad was busy, 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 traveling, preaching, and all. Uh, and he was a, a man who loved his work. And my mom was busy in the kitchen, so we hardly had time for even normal conversations, leave alone sexual conversations. And then I grew up with all these questions, and then, then I asked God to, to tell me what my calling was. He told me. One of the things he told me is, you, you will tell young people, you will tell an audience I will give you what the word of God says on some of these intimate matters. Me, Lord, me, of all people, we don't even have normal conversations in our family. If you would make yourself available to me, you, I can use you in that. And that's my journey so far. Okay, now, I want you to understand, as the theme of this camp says, looking up, I want you to understand that from Colossians chapter 3 verse 1 to 5 some things. Colossians chapter 3 1 to 5. I want to read it. I have it printed out. You can please follow along in your Bibles, your smartphone Bibles or your actual Bibles. And I want you to write along. You have some, uh, uh, you know, you have some uh, slides there. Uh, you can follow along that as well. Colossians chapter 3 verse 1 to 5. Since then you've been raised with Christ. Set your heart on things above. So look up, the Bible says. So this is written for believers, this is for, written for people who know the Lord. Set your hearts on things above. Look up where Christ is. Seated at the right hand of the Father. So the word of God says, look up. But part of looking up comes in verse 5. Colossians 1, 5. What does it say? The first phrase, can somebody read it for me? So what is what is looking up? Looking up doesn't mean literally looking up. Okay, uh, I don't care. I don't care if I work in a corporate company. I don't care if I'm a high school student. I don't care if I'm a college student. Okay, looking up means I'm going to keep looking up at Jesus who's in the city, the heavenly city, in the right hand of the Father. The Bible doesn't literally say look up. You know, all you get is the next prayer. Okay, that's not what the Bible says. What is looking up? From the word of God, let's understand. Verse 5 explains looking up in a practical way. Verse 5, what does it say? Colossians 3, 5. Put to death. Put to death, therefore, whatever belongs to your earthly nature. First on the list. Sexual immorality. First on the list. Sexual immorality. So looking up means not literally looking 
up and getting an X-ray, but in your practical day-to-day -day life, in our practical day-to-day -day life, saying no to sexual immorality, overcoming sexual temptation, and there are other entries in this list that connect us, connect with sexual sin. Uh, for example, uh, the second entry is impurity, lust, evil desires, and the first four have some sexual connotation. This is something very, very important. I am not making this up. This is found in the Word of God. Looking up at Jesus means taking a conscious effort, putting to death, killing, murdering, killing, murdering, fighting, ferociously fighting against sexual immorality, putting to death, impurity, lust and evil desires. No, I am 48 now. I accepted Jesus at the age of 11. I walked with Jesus many years, but even today as I speak to you, I battle sexual sin. There are times when I've lost to sexual sin. I, I confess to my wife, and she's gracious, and we pray. You know, this is not something that I am beyond. And no believer is beyond that. There was a young man who went to a famous Pentecostal preacher who was ministering in South Africa. David Duplices was his name. You know, Cam Duplices. Uh, one time CSK captain. Was he? Oh, no, not CSK captain. CSK player. Uh, maybe future CSK captain. I don't know. Okay, that's, that's what I'm here for that. Okay, now uh, David Duplices from South Africa. A young man uh, came up to David Duplices when he was in his 80s and said, uh, Preacher sir, can you tell me how old should I get when I stop getting sexual temptations? Improper thoughts about women. And then David Duplices, a senior man of God, Pentecostal leader, 80 years of age at that time, said, son, when I get that old, I will tell you, I will call you and tell you. Son, when I get that old and I don't get temptations, sexual temptations, I will tell you. But right now I do face sexual temptation. Now I want you to understand that the word of God calls us for sexual purity. In different sections of the Bible, in the New Testament, you know, I don't, we can go through the Bible, but for, for time's sake, for, because we have a short time, I want to tell you, you know, all the major New Testament writers, who are the major New Testament writers? Okay, the, the Bible was written by the Holy Spirit through human agents. So who are these human agents that the Holy Spirit used to write the New Testament? Major players, who? Simon Peter, thank you, yes. Paul, how many letters he wrote? 13 letters at least, 13 on the 27. John, John wrote at least five. John's Gospel, one John, two John, three John, and then Revelation, okay. There's another person who wrote two books. His name starts with L. I also get called by that name, but though my name is, sounds like his name, but not exactly his name. <coughs> Luke, Dr. Luke, the physician, he wrote, he wrote Luke's Gospel and Acts. And in Acts, the book of Acts, Luke records three places. Acts 15, 20, Acts 15, 29, Acts 21, 25. The book of Acts, talking about modern believers like us who attend local churches, talks about, gives us light about the local church life. He talks about sexual immorality. We must write to them, he writes, telling them to abstain from sexual immorality, Acts 15, 20, Acts 15, 29, and Acts 21, 25. So Luke wrote about it. Then Paul. Paul wrote about this in so many places. We would need a whole day to talk about it. But I want to tell you one, I want to quote from 2 Corinthians chapter 7 and verse 1. 2 Corinthians chapter 7 and verse 1. Look at your Bibles. Look at your Bibles. Since we have these promises, dear friends, let us purify ourselves. Okay, this is the, uh, you know, the Bible talks about two kinds of holiness. And one kind is gifted holiness. Say the word. Who gives us holiness? Jesus. The moment you come to Jesus and say, Jesus,
Jesus, I'm a sinner. Please forgive me. That instant, you are, you are made holy. The dying thief experienced that holiness because he was a robber and uh, he was caught and he was given that nation's highest punishment which was by, which was by crucifixion. And he was crucified. He was a bad guy. He was like the Ajman Kasab. India hung him to death. And in the Roman government, the highest form of punishment was, you know, crucifixion, public crucifixion. And he was a bad guy. But he looked at Jesus. And he realized his sin. He said, I deserve to die. But this man doesn't deserve to die. He realized he was a sinner. He looked at Jesus with faith. That instant, that second, he became a believer. Jesus gifted him righteousness. Jesus gifted him holiness. That's gifted holiness. But the same Bible that talks about gifted holiness talks about God and holiness. Say the word. Gifted holiness. God and holiness. God and holiness is, let's say that dying thief got off from the cross. Let's say he went back to his town. Do you think if he was a robber, do you think God's plan was him to continue robbing? Absolutely not. He had to guard that holiness that God gave him. So that's why this verse says in 2 Peter 2 Corinthians 7, 1, Therefore, we have these promises. Let us purify ourselves. Purify ourselves? That means let's guard our holiness. The holiness that God gave us. When we accepted Jesus, let's guard our holiness. From what? 2 Corinthians 7, 1. From everything that contaminates body. Everything that contaminates body, maybe porn watching coupled with masturbation, maybe sexual touching crossing the, the biblical boundaries, sexual touching. Now we will talk about all that. Everything that contaminates the body, purify ourselves. Contaminates body and spirit, not just body but spirit as well, from envy. And as, uh, as Pastor preached last Sunday, Saul felt the temptation of envy, jealousy from the spirits, from, from those kinds of sins, from the pride, envy, jealousy, from everything that contaminates body and spirit. And then this version used, I think it's ESV, uh, English chapter version says, perfecting holiness. That means every day we are on a journey to perfect holiness. We will not become perfect here and now, but we are driving towards it. It's like a one day game. Let's say the target is 400. Let's say it's the World Cup final. Let's say it's the 2023 World Cup final. Let's say it's India, Pakistan. Let's say Pakistan posted 400 and we need to score 401 to win the World Cup in Ahmedabad. I think the final is in Ahmedabad. And let's say the chase is on. That's the target. One and one is target. But over after over, we, we plan the chase. We perfect holiness. You know, every day of our life, every hour of our life, every minute of our life, every second of our life, every nanosecond of our life, we work on being holy. We might fail, we might trip and fall, but we get up, get a cleansing of the blood of Jesus, and move forward. When, we, when the Bible says, purify ourselves, it doesn't mean you do a good work and then you get purified. To, for purification, you always need to go to the blood of Jesus. 1 John 1 7 says, the blood of Jesus cleanses us from every sin. For purification, we will still go to the blood of Jesus. But we move forward. We move forward. You know, I don't have time, but I want to tell you that First Peter 2 11 also talks about sexual purity. 1 John 2 15 to 17 talks about sexual purity. Hebrews 34 talks about sexual purity. And uh, so there are so many passages, and we can talk about that all day, but we won't do that. As believers, we must be passionate about sexual purity. But I want you to understand, we are not saved because of our sexual purity. We are not saved because of our sexual purity. But having been saved, how many of you are saved? 
How many of you know Jesus as your Savior? Can, can I see your hand? Raise it high. Yes. You know Jesus as your Savior? You ask Jesus to forgive your sins. How many of you did it last night? Maybe for the first time. How many of you went away from Jesus and recommitted your life when you did it last night? Wonderful. You know, you know Jesus. So we are already saved. So we are not saved because of our sexual purity. But having been saved out of gratitude with God's help, we must be sexually pure. I can repeat this statement a hundred times. And I will not have, you know, overemphasize it. Okay, I'm going to say that again. We are not saved by, because of our sexual purity, but having been saved out of gratitude with God's help, we must be sexually pure. But I learned this first in the Old Testament. The Old Testament. What, is, what, did we, what did we read in Exodus chapter 20? What's so special about Exodus 20? Anybody? Exodus 20, what's so special about it? What do we read about it? What do we read about that? The Ten Commandments. Excellent. Awesome. You know, we read about the Ten Commandments there. But you know how that chapter begins? Exodus chapter 20, verses 1 and 2. God spoke these words. Verses 1. Verse 2. I am the Lord your God, who brought you out of Egypt, out of the land of slavery. Hey, this chapter is about Ten Commandments. Why all this irrelevant information? No, you're not irrelevant information. All important information. Exodus 22 is the all important information in Exodus 20. Why? God says, you were in Egypt. You were good for nothing. You, are, you, are, you, you could have been slaves in Egypt and gone to hell with Egypt. But I redeemed you. Not for your good, because of your good behavior. I did miracles and plucked you out of Egypt. I saved you by grace. How did I save you? By grace. Now that you are saved by grace, out of gratitude, you obey my commands. And two of those commands concern sexual purity. What is one command? Exodus 20 verse 14. You should not commit adultery. Exodus 20 verse 17. You should not covet your neighbor's wife. Two are the Ten Commandments. Talk about sexual purity. So God says, I saved you by grace from Egypt, but now, out of gratitude, out of your love for me. Why out of love for me? Because the God we worship, as we also heard during our last Sunday worship, our God, our worship leader. You know, God is holy, holy, holy. We are also holy. Spelling is different. We are H-O-L-E-Y, H-O-L-E-Y, H-O-L-E-Y. We are full of holes. We are also holy. Spelling is different. We are holy, holy, holy. You get at it, holy, 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 that means H-O-L-E-Y, 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 full of holes. You are full of holes. But God is H-O-L-Y, H-O-L-Y, H-O-L-Y. So He is the holy God. And if we love Him, and if we are grateful to Him, we will be holy. We will be holy. Okay, now, after, now, now that I've said this, let me quickly talk about what the Bible teaches about sex. Okay, God created sex for two reasons. Reason number one, for procreation. Why did God create sex? For procreation. God blessed them and said to them, be fruitful and increase in number. God gave a command to Adam, be fruitful and multiply. It was a command. So God got Adam and Eve married and he gave them a command, be fruitful and multiply. And we Indian believers are very good at that, obeying that command. That is why we are challenging China to become the most populous country in the world. So we are very good at that. And uh, Jacob had 12 sons. So entire cricket team plays for 12th man as well. Gideon had 70 sons. So he could have played a quadrangle cricket series. With plays for first umpire, second umpire, third umpire and all that. You know, be fruitful and multiply. Okay. We understand that for procreation. Second, for pleasure inside of marriage. Say that again. What did God create says? For pleasure inside of marriage. The Bible says in Proverbs 5, 18 to 20. This is unedited from the Bible. This is in the Bible, so I say it's, this is unedited. It says in Proverbs 5, 18 to 20. May your fountain be blessed. God is speaking to the young husband. May your fountain be blessed. May you rejoice in the wife of your youth. A loving though and graceful 
here. May I bless, satisfy you always. Word of God, directly, unedited. You know, the Bible is the frankest book in the whole world on the matters of sex. Direct. No beating about the bush. May I bless, satisfy you always. May you ever be intoxicated with our love. The Bible wants us to be intoxicated, not with alcohol. But after you get married, in your intimacy with your husband or your wife. That excitement is comparable to alcohol intoxication. No to alcohol intoxication, yes to sexual intoxication within the boundaries of marriage. No to alcohol intoxication, yes to sexual highs and intoxication within the boundaries of marriage. So that's why God created sex. But then there was a fellow called Lamech, say the name? Lamech. A character we read about in Genesis 4.19. He was the opening batsman, the Shukran's Guild, the Roy Sharma, the opening batsman in a long line of batsmen who went to abuse God's gift of sex, which is supposed to be used within the boundaries of marriage. What did Lamech do? The Bible says in Genesis 4.19, one day he was calling his wives. Calling his wife. Then you realize he had wives. That's when you realize he had wives. When he was calling his wives. Uh, and then the Bible records it in Genesis 4.19. He said, he called his wives. He said, Ada and Zillah. As one preacher friend of mine said, Lamech had wives A to Z. A for Ada, Z for Silla. He had wives A to Z. You know, God made one Adam and created one Eve and he married them. But he rebelled against the original plan of God for marriage. He, he married two women. He abused God's gift of sex. You know, God sets up boundaries. In, Gen in Job chapter 38 and verse 11, the Bible says, Speaking about sea waves, God says to the sea waves, This far you may come and no further. Here is where your proud waves halt. So God had a God has a boundary for the sea waves. Job 38, 11. But he also has boundaries for sex use. God has a boundary not just for sea waves, but also us on how we use sex. Because in the same book, in Job chapter 31 and verse 1, Job says, I will not look lustfully on a young woman. Married Job, he was married, we read about his, uh, his, what his wife said in Job chapter 2, you know, the early part of Job, Job was a married man, but he says, I will not look at a woman lustfully. Because Job understood that God had boundaries when it comes to the use of sex. Not just for the sea bed, but for sex as well. How do we abuse God's gift of sex? And I want to give you words starting with L and they end with the word, uh, the first word is, it starts with L, second word will end with T-I-O-N. Okay, the first, first of that series, okay? Okay, uh, by lustful meditation or imagining nudity. By lustful meditation, anybody say the word? Lustful, lustful meditation or imagining nudity. Now, to think about, look at a girl and think that girl is beautiful. Look at a boy and think that boy is handsome, no problem. Because uh, the Bible records many times in the book of Genesis. Genesis was written by Moses. And Moses writes about women. And he was not married to these women, but he writes under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit that several women in that book were beautiful. For example, in Genesis 24, 16, the Bible says, words of Moses, the woman was very beautiful, a virgin, no man had ever slept with her. In fact, maybe Eliezer was saying that, you know, Eliezer looked at this girl who was supposed to be marrying his master's son, and Eliezer felt that this girl was very beautiful. Eliezer was not sitting at that time. He saw a girl and he thought that girl was beautiful. Think of a you think, look at a girl, girl is beautiful, no problem. Look at a boy, boy is handsome, no problem. But then, what is sin? That's
that is beautifully explained in Job 31.1, the message version, where Job says, I just quoted Job 31.1, you look at a girl and you undress her in your mind. Undress, the word undress is used by Eugene Peterson, the pastor who translated, was used by God to give us the message version. Job 31.1. You look at a woman and undress her in your mind. That is sin. That is lust. Matthew 5.28. Jesus said, I just quoted that to you. Uh, you look at a woman, you look at you know, and if you look at her, look at her lustfully, you come to with her. So Jesus, what are you saying? So Jesus is saying, you don't need a bed to commit adultery. All you need is a dirty head. You don't need a bed to commit adultery. All you need is what? A dirty head. And it's not, say, the Bible doesn't talk about boys only lusting. The Bible is full of references of even girls lusting. Genesis 30, 39, 7. The Bible says, Mrs. Potiphar's wife took notice of jo Joseph. One version says, Mrs. Potiphar's wife gave a longing look at Joseph. And I know that longing look was a lustful look. Going by the request that she made to Joseph, come to bed with me. Longing look of Mrs. Potiphar. Lustful look. And in Ezekiel 23, we read about two girls. Ohala and Ohaliba. They lusted after the Assyrian governors and commanders, warriors in full dress, mounted horsemen, all handsome young men. They lusted at these military officers, these girls. The Bible talks about in Ezekiel 23, Ohala and Ohaliba. I want you to close your eyes quickly. 30 seconds. Close your eyes. If you think that you have displeased God in this area, and this has been happening regularly, say, Lord, I'm sorry. You say that as seated as you are, hand over your heart, say, Lord, I'm sorry for lusting. Lusting with my thoughts. Say sorry. Ask the God of Jesus to cleanse me. Ask the God of Jesus to cleanse me. In Jesus. The second way we abuse God's people sex by looking at titillation or watching porn. Okay, what's the L word? Looking. But looking at titillation or watching porn. The L word is looking and then the second word is the D I O N titillation. Looking at titillation or watching porn. You know, in the book of in Leviticus chapter 18, I want you to do a homework, read that chapter in a version like NKJV or ESV or New American Standard Bible. These are very good Bible translations, essentially literal translations as we call it, as, you know, as we call it, okay, ESV or NKJV or NASB. And you count the number of word, number of times the word nakedness occurs, but naked occurs, you will find at least 14 occurrences. So what is the message of Leviticus 18? What is the message of Leviticus 18 for the Levi genes wearing generation? We love the Levi jeans. We find it was a, it was a, it was a clothing with a generation long. Okay, it's, it's, it, it, its brand ambassador is Deepika Padukone. You know, uh, she's supposed to be the representative of many young Indians. Okay, what is Leviticus 18's message for the Levi jeans generation? A woman's nakedness belongs to the eyes of her husband alone. A woman's nakedness belongs to the eyes of her husband alone. A man's nakedness belongs to the eyes of his wife alone. A man's nakedness belongs to the eyes of his wife alone. The porn world wants to change that. The porn world wants to make the woman's nakedness open for every Tom, Dick and Harry. That's the problem with the porn world. That's why when David got off to that balcony and from a vantage point he looked at the dark of Bathsheba. What was David doing? He looked at the butt of Bathsheba. The Bible says in 2 Samuel eleven twenty seven, the thing that David did displeased the Lord. The thing that David did displeased the Lord. And when we watch porn, it displeases the Lord. You know, uh, since this is a, this is almost like a plague in our time and society. I want to spend a little more time there. Why 
is on a sin. We must understand from the Bible. P O R N. I want to give you another acronym. I'm making a digression to to hammer this even more deeper into our hearts. P peace loss. You know, in Song of Songs chapter eight and verse ten, the husband and wife are talking, and the wife is topless and standing before her husband. She is not wearing any clothes. The husband is talking to his wife, and they are talking in conversation. The wife says to the husband, Song of Songs eight ten. The Bible is direct. I will be direct. The Bible is blunt. I will be blunt. And she says, "This is from the Bible, Song of Songs, eight ten. She says, "I am a wall, and my breasts are like towers. Thus, I have become in his eyes like one bringing bringing contentment." So the wife saw what in the husband's eyes? What did he? What did she see? She's standing topless before her husband. And what did she see in, in her husband, husband's eyes? Contentment or peace, but if what the husband sees is not the wife. Let's say a porn star, the peace will go for a hardy pandya six. The peace will go for it. If the nude person you are watching is not already your spouse, if the nude person I am watching is not Evangeline Blue, but someone else. Close your eyes and say, Lord, I'm 
sorry for the times I watched porn. You know, I want to be honest. The times when I watched porn, even after I became a believer, even after I became a preacher of God's word, I can I confess that to my wife, and I walk in victory. Thank God, He gives me grace. But there's nothing in the Bible that tells us we can keep on living in God's sin. I'm aware of that. And he said, Lord, I'm sorry. Wash me. Cleanse me. Cleanse me, Lord. For the times of failure. The blood of Jesus will cleanse us from every sin. He will cleanse you right now. I will not think of porn as another collection of dots on the computer. I will not try to justify porn watching. I'm sorry. Trust me. You say that to God. Sing that to God. Can you raise your hand and drop it down? You sing that, you bring that prayer. Can you raise your hand and drop it down? Thank you, thank you. Thank you for those hands, yes. You don't have to be ashamed of showing your intent for sexual purity. Raise that hand and drop it down. Thank you. Sorry, God. I'm repenting of you. One watching. The third way we abuse God's gift of sex. Okay, the other point we'll go quickly. Okay, because we're running out of time. By lurid conversation or flirty talk or sex thing. The other word is lurid, con L lurid conversation. Conversation is a DIY word of flirty talk or sex thing. You know, Nehemiah had a government job in a foreign country. What did Nehemiah have? A government job in a foreign country. He took long leave and came back to Jerusalem. He was busy rebuilding the wall. And in Nehemiah chapter 6, verses 1 to 4, a group of men came. I think they were balding men. They were older men. I think. I don't know. Bible doesn't say. I think they are balding old men. They were the leaders of the country. They said, Nehemiah, we want to talk with you. Nehemiah, we want to talk with you. Nehemiah, we want to do a conference with you. What is the menu for the conference? The plains of Olo, the Bible says. You read Nehemiah 6, 1 to 4. Nehemiah, we want to talk with you. And we want to meet you in the plains of Olo. You know what Nehemiah said? Oh no, I'm not coming to Olo. Oh no, I'm not coming to Olo. Then God has given me a great work. I took leave from my company to come and do that work. The walls of Jerusalem are broken down. God has given me a team. I'm rebuilding the walls of Jerusalem. I don't have time to chit chat with you. That's what Nehemiah told a bunch of old leaders, old balding leaders. Imagine what you would have said if some pretty girls were trying to talk to them. Pretty young girls. I think you would have been far more strict. If you were so strict with the old fellows who were trying to waste this time, I believe Nehemiah would have been more strict with pretty girls who were trying to say, Uncle, I want to talk with you. Uncle, you're so handsome. The Bible says twice in the New Testament, 2 Timothy chapter 2 verse 16, 1 Timothy chapter 6 verse 20, twice, flee from ungodly chapter. What? Who, who said this words? Who wrote second, uh, first Timothy and second Timothy? Who wrote? Louder! Who wrote? Okay, Paul said this to who? Timothy. Okay. Timothy, when we read the New Testament, is a timid person, shy person. So you think a shy person would be talking too much? Shy person? To get that fellow speak one or two sentences is not a problem. But Paul tells super shy Timothy who hardly spoke, and Paul had the energy to stop. Flee ungodly chatter. That means even if you are super shy and you hardly speak one or two sentences, and you rarely speak with the opposite sex, hardly speak with the boys, and rarely speak with the girls, be godly in your chatter. Be godly in your chatter. If you are sending something on WhatsApp and deleting it, there must be a problem. There must be a problem. 
ungodly shackle. Say no to it. Say no to it. The fourth way we abuse God's gift of sex. Let loose body exploration. Let loose body exploration of petting, fondling, sexual kissing, oral sex, all the course. You know, there are some young kids who are also in the session. I'm aware of that. I want you young children, my daughter is there, 13 years of age, you rather hear these terms from me, from, from my mouth. I am a youth preacher who aligns my preaching in the light of the written word of God. You rather hear these terms first from me, a, a person like me, youth preacher who aligns his thinking in the light of God's word. Then from your friends in school who may be influenced by pornography or by some secular psychologist. You know what? I have an article which was published by Week magazine uh, the other day, in the month of uh, August. Uh, right now, Anuja Chauhan says, she's talking about the movie Oh My God 2, reviewing the movie, Hindi movie Oh My God 2. Okay, and she says, commenting about the movie, the fact that all, teenage, all teenagers masturbate and that teenage masturbation is normal. So this is a secular writing. I don't expect anything different from her. Secular writing, writing for a secular magazine week, commenting on a movie that apparently addresses teenage masturbation. She says, the fact that all teenagers, uh, all teenagers masturbate and teenage masturbation is normal. You know, that's what she says. I don't, I'm going to skip some lines. And then she says the last paragraph. Now, I'm not saying we shouldn't talk to children about masturbation. We should. We should also talk to them about much more troubling topic, pornography, which goes hand in hand with masturbation. But, and that remains the elephant in the room that this movie, talking about Oh My God 2, this movie badly acknowledges, perhaps because it's too rampant, too dark, too financially important, and doesn't fit into the cozy mind middle class bodily function genre. She says, if that movie talked about how pornography fuels masturbation, maybe they won't get funding for that movie. So that movie doesn't talk about how porn coupled is, is coupled with masturbation. Now this is what this is what the secular press says. Now even before our children hear all this, let's hear it from the word of God. Let's in fact I believe you know they should hear it from parents in the living home. And I try to do that because I have two children. One at, one at the age of 19, one at the age of 15. And, I, and we talk frankly about these topics uh, to the point that you know, my, dad, my daughter will say, Dad, stop! And she pinches me on the, on the side. And Ivan also says, shut up. You know, but we talk frankly. And we must talk frankly. So by let loose body exploration of, or by petting or bottling, the Bible talks about it. Ezekiel 23. Read Ezekiel 23. There was a time when you came to Sunday school and you learned Psalm 23. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. But now you have grown up, you're a teen, you're a pre-teen, you're, you're a late teen, you're in your early twenties. You need to learn the lesson of Ezekiel 23. We read about Ohala and Ohaliba. And the Bible says, frankly, verse 3, verse 8, men slept with them, they caressed their breasts and poured their lust on them. The Bible is frank and frank. So if you think that doing what Monica Lewinsky did with, famously did with Bill Clinton is not really a big deal with God, I'm here to tell you, based on God's word, it is a sin against God. Sexual touch, even if it doesn't listen, result in intercourse, is a sin against God. Because the Bible calls it boredom in Ezekiel 23. In fact, you don't need the Bible to know that because a pagan king in Genesis 26, when he saw Isaac fondling his wife, Isaac sexually touching his wife, he said, come here, come here, come here, Isaac. Isaac, come here, come here, come here. Yesterday you said that that girl was his sister, that beautiful woman was his sister. But how come I looked at the window, you're touching that beautiful girl? Because a pagan king, a king who doesn't know the Bible, a king who is not a Jesus follower, a king who is not a Yahweh follower, knew you can only intimately 
you touch a person, if that person is your is your spouse, is your wife, is your husband. That's why he said, I said, come here. You said she's your sister, but why are you touching her? Why are you sexually touching her? This is 26, 6 to 9. Proverbs 7, we read about a naughty boy. Who do we read about? Are you alright? Who do we read about in Proverbs 7? Naughty boy. And he had an affair with flirty auntie. So let me summarize that chapter to you. First, he was strolling. Verse 8. Proverbs 7, verse 8. He was strolling. What's the first step? Strolling. Second step, she was stripping. She was dressed like a prostitute. Verse, verse 10, she was dressed like a... He was strolling, she was stripping. Third step, verse 13, they were smooching. They were sexually kissing. Third step. Fourth step, verse 18, they were bed. They were bed. They were sleeping. And the fifth step, he was sinking. Verse 23 says, an arrow pierces his liver. liver. That means his conscience, there was something pricking him. He was, he was, he was, you know, he was sinking in guilt. And then verse 27, he was in Sheol. Sheol is the Old Testament word for hell. He went into an eternity without God. Strolling, stripping, smooching, sleeping, sinking, Sheol. So don't say, you know, I kissed my girlfriend today, from tomorrow onwards, we will only shake hands and wink at each other. That doesn't happen. You know, lesser forms of intimacy, you graduate to greater forms of intimacy. After you finish LKG, you go to UKG, you get into first standard. You don't go back to LKG. So that's why kissing is very dangerous. That's why going to a, you know, a locked room space and even hand-holding is dangerous. Abuse of God's gift of sex, next way. Lesbianism and sodomization. By lesbianism and sodomization. With the practice of homosexuality. Jude verse 7 says, God is sending an eternal fire on Sodom and Gomorrah. Eternal fire. What happened in Genesis is only temporary fire. So if homosexuals remain the same way, they don't repent. They say, God made me that way. You know, I, 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 I was born like this. You they keep giving those excuses and living that sin. Bible says eternal fire is coming on them. This is the word of God. You know, if God wanted to okay homosexuality, it's very easy for him. He would have created three couples in God and God of Eden. He would have said, Adam and Eve, I bless you. Adam and Steve, I bless you. Homosexual couple. Eve and Eve, I bless you. Adam and Eve, I bless you. Adam and Steve, I bless you. Even, even, I bless you. Three trees, three couples. Simple manifestation. I'm searching under all the trees. Only one couple is there. This never entered the mind of God. It's a sin. We love the homosexuals. We will give them a bear heart. We will jump on them like Saul Gandhi jumped on Mohammed Khan. After Mohammed Khan and Mohammed Khan, when you not sing, put a wonderful partnership and made India win that. Stop in finals in Lords in 2002. A match which we remember. Maybe some of you are not born. I remember. I helped my wife come to him. Shout on Mohammed Cash. That's a very kind of We can hug the homosexuals in the way. Come to him. Mohammed Cash. We, 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 we love them. But we still say, like John the Baptist, it's wrong for you to keep your brother's wife. We say homosexuality remains a sin. It will remain a sin. But God will give us grace to repent from it. Because in 1 Corinthians chapter 6, 9 to 11, the Bible says there were former homosexuals in that church. And the pastor may have preached about homosexuality. They repented. They were now believers. They may be a volunteers in the church. Former homosexuals in the church of Corinth. Formerly homosexual, but now redeemed by Jesus. 1 Corinthians 6, 9 to 11. How do we abuse God's gift of sex? By lazy sex for masturbation. Lazy sex for masturbation. The Bible directly doesn't talk about masturbation. But doesn't mean we can masturbate. The Bible says in 1 Corinthians 7 9, it is better to marry than burn with passion. 
If masturbation was okay, the Bible would have said it's better to masturbate than go to passion. But the Bible does not say it's better to masturbate than go to passion. Instead, the Bible says it's better to marry than go to passion. So the only gift free sex happens within the circle. What is this? Not the circle, square. Within the square. What is the square? Everybody, please come. What is the square? Only guilt free sex happens within the square. What is the square? Wait, wait, I'll, I'll show you. Okay, what is the square? The square of marriage. The only guilt free sex happens within the square of marriage. One day your time will come. You get in that square. And in that square, no problem. That too, you need to get marriage permission. That too, you need to get marriage. What is that coming? Get marriage permission. Keep on having it. Okay. Is it the boundaries of marriage? But why is it called lazy sex? Why do I call it lazy sex? Why is it called lazy sex? Because, you know, sex inside of marriage. This is a marriage man speaking to you. 22 years of marriage. Got married on July 9th, 2001. And even within marriage, you know, God designed that you have long, unhurried conversation with your wife. And you demonstrate to her that you're unselfish. And you genuinely love her. And after all these long conversations could come occasions for marital sexual intimacy. It's hard work. The media might portray it as bam bam, thank you ma'am. No, that's not how it happens in, inside marriage. Not, doesn't happen that way. Not, no, bam bam, thank you ma'am. I'm snoring sleep. If you snore and sleep, you might get a divorce soon. It's unselfish. Marriage is about unselfish. That's what Eliezer was trying to test of the girl who was going to marry Isaac. Will this girl give me water and also camel's water? What was he testing? Is this girl a giver? Because to get to become marriage material, that people are talking to you. I'm sharing my heart. To become marriage material, you need to be unselfish. Because if you're selfish, you're supremely unfit for marriage. If you do not know how to give, and if you do not know the ex go the extra mile and give unselfishly, you become supremely unfit for marriage. That's what Eliezer was testing under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. Will this girl give me water and also my camels? Because only givers can be good wives. Givers can be good husbands as well. Unsimple givers. So if you don't have time for all that, masturbation is a lazy sex. There are so many verses against laziness. In Proverbs, even Jesus spoke against laziness. In John 7.33, John 9.4. So masturbation is also called lazy sex. And then I am coming close to another important topic. Another way we abuse God's gift of sex. By lost person romantic affection. By falling in love with an unbeliever. Lost person, not literally lost. Lost because no outside of the gospel. Lost person, unbeliever. By falling in love with an unbeliever. The Bible talks about this through an example. Example Solomon. He was the brainiest person alive. The brainiest person alive, all his brains were brainwashed by the women he married. Women who worship idols. And then we are 13, 26. Okay, where do you read about Solomon's story in the Bible? Which book? Tell me. Solomon's story is written in which book? What is it? John's Gospel. Matthew's Gospel. Where? Do you read about it? First case. And who is talking about Solomon? Nehemiah. Long after Solomon lived and died, his example lived. What is his example? The previous man. All his brains were brainwashed with the women he married. He ended up worshipping idols. That's why, young man, I'll, I want to tell you something. Because I love you, I tell you the truth. Because I love you, I tell you the truth. The one you take to bed will influence your head. The one you take to bed will influence your head. So be careful who you marry. 
the brainiest man ended up as an idol worshiper because he married scores of idol worshiping women. And the Bible says, not first to get seven nine, seven thirty nine. There's a mistake there. Seven thirty nine. I said that it was my mistake. But uh, so please correct me. First Corinthians seven thirty nine says, you can marry anyone, but in the Lord. So the only non-negotiable behavior. For some time, I was uh, working at HSBC Auto Finance, uh, arm of HSBC Bank, talking to American customers sitting in Hyderabad, collecting car loans from them, and uh, we used to call customers and ask them to pay their monthly car due. Some of them would abuse this bank with choices of use. One customer said, now if you want to keep calling me, I will find out where you are and I will bring my car and he talked about a part of my body behind my back and I will sh shout the car there. I said, I think, sir, is that really possible? I put it on you. <laughs> I said, is that really possible? But some of my other classmates, uh, sorry, not classmates, other team members would put the call on you and abuse the customer back. But suppose when they're abusing the customer back and the team leader comes, that's non-negotiable behavior. In corporate terms, NMB, non-negotiable behavior. You can't abuse the customer back even if the customer is so rude to you. Non-negotiable behavior. The only, and the, 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 C, the, the team leader or the manager can take your back and send you off. You know, send you off the company. You can lose the job for that very minute. So because it's non-negotiable behavior. The only NMB when it comes to life partner choice, First Corinthians seven thirty nine. You can marry anyone, but in the Lord, you can marry anyone. So that's why a Tamil pastor can marry a young Maharashtrian girl who came to Chennai to be trained for ministry. It's not a sin. I'm talking about your pastor, Pastor Jay, and Pastor Anjali. That's why a Pakka South Indian like you, Jairaj, Pakka South Indian in every sense of the word can marry a girl who is half Telugu with the, some Rajasthani mix with a father from northern part of Tamil Nadu and Pakka South Tamil Nadu people have no connection with North Tamil Nadu people we know that, that's how it works but we can still get married because the Bible says in 1st Corinthians 7.39 you can marry anyone, anyone means anyone you can marry anyone but in the Lord no compromise there no compromise there. You say I will convert them. When you say I will try to convert them, you are acting more intelligent than God. Because the book of Acts, where we read about missionary strategy, Acts 28 chapters, you read it. Not once apostles, Peter or Paul or any of these great states, not once did they say, fall in love with an unbeliever and then convert them. They didn't say that. But if you are trying to do that, you are smarter than God. Don't try to be smarter than God. That's not a missionary strategy mentioned in the Bible. But what happened to Solomon can happen to us. Solomon's wives wrongly influenced him. He wanted up in idol worship. And then I want to, in this context, talk about dating. Okay, I want to put dating in biblical perspective. And I want to quickly mention the acronym D A T E. D degeneration into sinful sexual intimacy. I already talked about Psalm Proverbs 7. Proverbs 7, strolling, stripping, smooching, oh you know that, right? <laughs> strolling, stripping by manner, smooching together, sinking in guilt and sure. So when you meet with a person, the opposite sex, it invariably leads to Disintegrations into a simple physical intimacy. One day, before Darasha's class 10 exam, you know, uh, uh, she was, you know, Darasha, she went to the study hall seats next to Kwasal for her to study. But she always has a fixed time to study, last night before exam. The, the last night before exam is when she studies. But still, what grace she gets over the 90, sometimes over 95, that's the grace of God, that's God's favor upon her. Uh, but you know what, so during this 10th, we had almost 15, 20 days. So I took her to Starbucks, one of the Starbucks near our place, uh, when we were living in another part in Chennai. Okay, and then Starbucks, a, a young boy and a girl, her age maybe, 14 or 15, they 
entered into the restroom inside Starbucks and locked the door. They come to Starbucks to have coffee, but then they graduated into entering in the restroom of that Starbucks and walk the room. Dating can disintegrate into simple physical intimacy before marriage. So sin against God in 2 Timothy chapter 3 verse 6. 2 Timothy chapter 3 verse 6, Paul talks about false teachers who went into women's houses. Obviously the men were not there. Obviously the door was locked. They wormed their way into home. Worm, the word worm is used. They secretly, worm means they secretly went into the house. 2 Timothy 3 6. And they had conversations with gullible women. And these women were down with their lust. So never get into a locked room situation with a person of the opposite sex. That's something we understand from the word of God. Very clear. Did it degeneration into a physical, simple physical impression? A. Abortion of God's plan for in marriage meaningful conversation. You know, God has a plan that you get married and inside marriage you have hours of romantic conversation with your wife. The way Elkanah talked with Hannah. You know how Elkanah talked with Hannah Charles Constant. Elkanah talked with Hannah. Hannah didn't have children. He said, Hannah, why are you weeping? Why don't you eat? Why are you downhearted? Don't I mean more to you than ten sons? Romantic conversation. You have time for that inside marriage. So why do you try to do that before marriage? Okay, a portion of God's plan by in marriage meaningful conversation. The trap of getting to know each other. The trap of getting to know each other. That is a trap because only God absolutely knows. John chapter 2, last verse. Only Jesus knows the other person absolutely. So don't try to do what only Jesus can do. Know the other person. And then the next word, E. Examples of the opposite sex being together in group settings in the New Testament. The New Testament we carefully see. We always see that men and women together were together in groups. In spiritual meetings, Acts 1, 13 and 14. I want you to close your eyes. All eyes close. You know, there are some things else I will cover later. But I want you to just make a commitment right now. All eyes closed. Shall we kneel down in God's presence? Shall we kneel down in God's presence? I want you to kneel down. Can you open your Bibles? Can you open your Bibles? A pledge that you wait till marriage to have sex. Wait till marriage to have sex. And if you make a pledge, I want you to write. Do you have a pen with you? Write it. Write just at the back here with your wife. A pledge before God. This is a challenge. Okay, a pledge to write in the back here with your wife. Okay, this is the pledge. This is the pledge. Write it down. Okay. I promise. Write it down. I promise. I promise to wait till marriage to have sex with the Holy Spirit helping me. Okay. Are you ready to make a pledge? Yes. I promise to wait till marriage to have sex with the Holy Spirit helping me. I promise my future life partner. I promise my future life partner. I don't want your sex now. I promise my future life partner, I don't want your sex now. I can wait till we make the marriage vow. I can wait till we make the marriage vow. I want to repeat. I promise to wait till marriage to have sex with the Holy Spirit helping me. I promise my future life partner, I don't want your sex now. I can wait till we make the marriage vow. Sign your name, sign your name. Sign your name, put today's date, October 2nd, 2023. And if you have a neighbor, girl with girl, boy with boy, 
give your Bible or your diary, whatever you're looking for, to your neighbor and get the neighbor's signature. That is witness signature. Praise the Lord. Okay, on that note, I will show time to finish this session. Uh, maybe we can sing a song at least. Uh, and then we have a group discussion. And then we listen. Thank you.